afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is June Kohler, and I'm the of the Americas and Europe. Um, Danielle and I will be doing a gallery talk today. I'm going to introduce her first. She's going to be talking about the pieces here and celebrating Oregon artists. Uh, so this is Danielle Knapp. She's the Makosh Associate Curator here at the JSA. Thank you. So we'll do the first half hour or so downstairs and then move upstairs to the Schnitzer Gallery and June will take over. Um, and in talking about celebrating Oregon artists, we won't talk specifically about all of the artwork on, on display because you might recognize some of the works on view right now as having been in recent exhibitions. Um, so you might have seen them in the past, but most of what's on view is the first time that they've been on display in our museum. Um, and that's primarily because they're all recent acquisitions. All of the works on view came to our collection within the last five years. They weren't all created within the last five years, though, so some date back much earlier. Um, and most of them came to us either through gift, um, several are gifts from the artists themselves. Um, and then a very important aspect of our recent acquisitions of work by Oregon artists include some works that were purchased through the Oregon Arts Commission grants um, through the Ford Family Foundation. So we actually have the three artworks that we received uh, for being awarded that grant in the last three years on view in this space. Uh, it's really exciting to have works by living Oregon artists on view at the museum. Of course, our Pacific Northwest collection is a very strong component of our collecting philosophy here. Since Virginia Hazeltine, the collector who really stimulated that collecting, those collecting practices, adding on to the museum's founding collection of um, Asian art in the 1960s with um, her guidance in pursuing artwork by important artists from Oregon and Washington and the surrounding area, as well as major gifts from her collection, this museum has been focused on adding to our Pacific Northwest collection. All the works on view, too, it's important to note, um, are not the only works that we acquired in the last five years by Oregon artists. Um, but we thought this was a great sampling representing the different backgrounds from which active artists have come to the state, different processes and media that they're working in. Um, and it's just a really nice snapshot showing what our curatorial team has been looking to add to the collection recently in the direction that we're hoping to take the Northwest collection. So I'll point out some interesting things about some of the most recent acquisitions starting with this triptych of etchings by Betty LaDuke, an artist from Ashland. And Betty is actually celebrating her 80th birthday this year with a retrospective at the Schneider Art Museum at Southern Oregon University. Um, this art, the artwork in this show is also very special to June and me because many of the works on view represent studio visits that we made or conversations we had with the galleries to represent these artists. And in this particular case, we were invited to visit Betty at her studio uh, earlier this year to take a look at her body of work and although her work has been placed in museums throughout Oregon and beyond a lot of it still rests in her home studio. She, going through the artwork that she has on view in her home uh, is really going through a journey of her life. She was born in the Bronx and traveled from as a young adult began her travels uh, internationally. She spent time in Mexico after her college years working among indigenous populations, drawing the women, going about their day-to-day -day activities there. Uh, she traveled throughout Europe. She traveled ultimately to every continent except for Antarctica. And really, she's been motivated by wanting to capture the personalities and the real life of communities that she visited. And so a lot of her artwork is very bright in color, represents the, sort of the day-to-day -day activities and the important aspects of family, of farming, of sustainability in these communities. So she has been very involved with the organization Heifer International for the last couple of decades and done a lot of artwork visiting countries that they, um, that they service. And so we were really delighted to receive this as a gift from the artist this last year. And we expect to have more work by her coming to the collection in the future too. Uh, I should mention too that not all of the artists on view, th these works are not the first works by them to come in our, into our collection. In Betty's case, we have several earlier works that were already in the collection. Um, Judith Pox and Pox made one earlier work from the 1970s, but this is our most recent acquisition on view, which is a double weave tapestry by the Portland-based artist Judith Pox and Pox, um, which we did receive because of the Oregon Arts Commission in the past year. It's titled Calendar, and what Pox and Pox has done with her weaving is really elevated this craft to something that incorporates not just abstraction, but when she does her inlay technique, so this is an example of double weave, but her inlay technique um, she also works often in, and that allows her to create representational imagery. So the wide range of the work that she produces allows her to be very creative, not just in imagery, but if you get up close and look at this, you can see that it has this dimensionality because the double weave technique allows her to add a 3D, a 3D element to it. 
Let's move into this corner of this gallery and we'll talk about a few of the works on view right here. We're in part in honor of our retired curator of American Regional Art, Lawrence Fong. So a really touching gift to the collection representing his relationship between the curator and the artist's mutual respect and admiration. It's the first work by Kramer to enter our collection. So of course we were excited about it for that reason too. Um, this is a work that if you're not familiar with his current technique that he's been using, he really makes 2D work sculptural, in this case by using wood burning tools um, to kind of work into the surface of the, of the wood. So it's interesting to look closely and think about what was involved. It's more than just using a paintbrush in this particular case, but it's about thinking about how do you create the depth on a 2D surface. Um, he was quite successful with that. We also were able to use a new acquisition fund we have in support of making Pacific Northwest purchases. Um, to get this work by Rick Barto, who's based out of Newport. He's been a very prominent organ artist on a national and international scale for several years, especially recently the work that he did for the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. And this particular piece was exciting to us because although we have five other works by Barto in our collection, um, nothing was as referential to Japanese artists. This. A lot of his other work reference, references his Native American ancestry and the communities, uh, Native American communities in the state. This particular work was created in 1998 when he and his gallerist, um, Charles Fraley, traveled to Japan. He actually made three trips to Japan in different seasons. So he went in spring and he went in winter and I think he returned later in the following summer. Um, and so he was inspired by work that he had seen in Japan. He was inspired by scroll paintings. It's fairly obvious to see sort of the similarity between what he's done here and Japanese scroll paintings. Um, but he also, for creating this, he used traditional Japanese ink and paper that he got from a specialty shop in Japan. So really sort of fostering a dialogue between art that he created in Oregon and the art that he admired in Japan. Um, Mel Katz is another Portland artist, and I should mention too, her, probably most of the artists on view here, um, Oregon Art Beat has done interviews and studio visits with many of them, so if you're interested in Tom Kramer's work, if you're interested in Mel Katz's work, there are great interviews available online um, that shows the process behind the scenes. And uh, Mel Katz especially is someone who, when he talks about his work, you really get a sense of his sense of humor and the kind of whimsy and the approach he takes to his artwork. He moved to Oregon, to Portland, in the 60s, having come from um, Brooklyn, because he was invited to teach at the Museum Art School at the Portland Art Museum, which later became PNCA. And he didn't think at the time that he would be in Oregon permanently. He actually at one time was married to the then mayor of Portland, Mayor Katz. Um, so he ended up spending the whole rest of his life in Portland and is still a really prominent, active artist there. He was represented by Arlie Schnitzer's Fountain Gallery while the gallery was open. And he, his work comes down to the simple principle of exploring line and shape. So he starts all of his artwork with a drawing, interested in just what happens with lines, what he calls scribbles. And he was originally a painter, so at the time when he came to Portland, he really was working in, in painting, strict traditional painting. Um, and eventually what emerged out of that was that interest in how do you make a 2D image into something 3D, and how do you go back and forth, and what kind of tension can you create with that um, environment of sort of confusing painting and drawing and sculpture together. These particular works are, are deceptively, they look very simple when you first look at them, and when you think about what he's been doing here, you can see it's the kind of work that really, you can take advantage of looking at it from other angles to see how carefully he's laid out the linoleum on the wood that's been cut. And a lot of his other work um, that you might be familiar with, including a large sculpture that we frequently have had on view in our foyer or hallways downstairs, um, have been large machine cut metal pieces. So he's been working with, uh, starting with his drawing and then working with people who are skilled in computer programs that allow him to translate his original idea of the drawing into something 3D. So a lot of his work that's made from uh, metal and from other sort of, he likes to use linoleum and other materials that are sort of unexpected in fine art um, have been cut in a shop, in a workshop uh, by specialists working with heavy machinery and then delivered to his studio. And, um, I was visiting with him once when he was getting a delivery of something he'd been waiting to get back from the studio. So it was the first time he was seeing the finished product completely in the 3D. It started as this idea and he turned over to the people, to his assistants, and he was so excited to see it. Uh, it was just really wonderful to see someone reacting so strongly to the excitement of their finished work. 
he calls these the chunkies, um, and they actually are work that he created in the 80s, so they were shown, I think, at the Fountain Gallery um, before it closed in 86, but he um, didn't intend for them to be on the wall necessarily. They could have also been used as floor pieces. They could have been turned on their side. Um, he didn't dictate exactly how they had to be exhibited, which was fun for us because we got to sort of play with how do we think they look best and how do we want viewers to experience them. And that's something that uh, Mel Katz finds very fun to, to see his work sort of be interpreted by different eyes. What's the lighting part of this piece? Um, oh, are you looking at the shadows? Yeah. Like, that is something, that's a great question, because that is something we took into account when we were when we were installing our work and talking about um, the lighting that would be done, because you can do so many interesting things with the overlapping shadows with these pieces. So uh, in most cases, when we light our work for museum shows, the idea is to not draw any attention to the lighting, because we don't want anything to distract from the experience of looking at the art. But I do think in this particular case, the light provides sort of additional um, thoughts to consider the way the shadows play out. Uh, we can mention some of the works in this corner to wrap things up in this gallery, and we're happy to answer any questions before we go upstairs. Um, we have two works on view. It's actually considered one work together. It's a two-part um, photographic work by Dan Powell, who's faculty here at the University of Oregon. He's taught in the art department, um, the photography department, since mid-1980s. And these particular works are called Blue Skies. Um, so this is something, he's very conceptual in his artwork, and he likes the fact that you really need to know the title to know how to approach these particular images. So in this case, without knowing what the title is, you might look at that and think, well, I see a gray square, but what more do you want me to, to read into this? Um, knowing that these are photographs that he took of Blue Skies invites questions about the role of photography in documenting the natural environment and what the final result of the photograph, what, what level of interpretation you might expect your viewers to have, because he's taken a picture of something real, but the result could be considered abstract or minimalist, uh, but in fact it's a commonplace thing, blue sky. Um, he actually intended these artworks to not be framed. We had them on view a year and a half or so ago when we had the faculty show in the Barker Gallery, and at that time we were able to install them just by thumbtacks into the wall um, or magnets, something very uh, non-intrusive and allowed the edges of the photographs to be shown. Um, in this particular case, because he didn't put restrictions on how they could be used in the future, we thought it was best to frame them for this gallery space. But it's interesting to know, too, about the artist's intent for how he wants you to encounter the artwork. And the final artwork um, I'll mention downstairs is by Portland artist Michael Brophy. This was, um, we have several of his smaller works in our collection, but when we were able to purchase this, uh, I could not purchase it, a gift from the artist in the Laura Russo Gallery um, two or three years ago. It was very exciting because he's been working on this larger scale for the last couple of years, and we didn't have anything of this size. And what he's been doing with this is really interesting in terms of Oregon art. Uh, a lot of the artists, when we talk about artists of the Pacific Northwest, we talk about how they might be responding to the natural environment, the unique atmosphere of the region. Um, being in Oregon, you're somewhat removed. It's less true now in a more global, interconnected society where the world becomes very small. But not so long ago, New York and Chicago were extremely far away in terms of artistic um, connections, artistic influence in the Northwest. And so there's still some of that tradition at work with Oregon artists who choose to paint um, images of Oregon. Uh, in Michael Brophy's work, he is interested in documenting the changing landscape of the state in terms of what human interaction is doing to it. He's not um, trying to be an eco-activist, he's not trying to make sort of an opinion one way or the other, he's just interested in this is happening. So he has made paintings of this size and larger, showing the back of large trucks that he's followed when he's been driving around Oregon highways, trucks that are hauling lumber somewhere, hauling materials across the state. He's interested in sort of the commercial exchange of goods in the state, and then also of the imprint of man on the landscape. So this is this beautiful, serene, um, landscape at dawn, it's called Crack of Dawn, he's included, you almost don't even notice at first, he's included a little outhouse in the bottom left. So you can't ignore the fact that there's a human presence in this scene from Oregon. Um, we're happy to answer a couple questions here if you have any, and then we can go upstairs, or if you prefer, we can save our questions for upstairs and talk at the end of the entire uh, tour. Is there anything pressing right now?
Well, before you leave here, maybe you could comment on this off-the-wall piece. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a work by uh, Jim Griswold. It was on view previously in the Birds and Flowers exhibition that was in the Schnitzer Gallery um, a year or two ago. And Jim Griswold is someone who works out of Portland. He was previously the, um, I can't remember his exact title, artistic director. Um, I've forgotten the name of the... Thank you, thank you, Wyden <laughs> Kennedy. Um, so working in advertising, and his work is very playful and interesting in that he likes these sort of crazy juxtapositions. We have other works of his on view right now. Um, right now, there's a, his Bastille Chairman Mao photograph, digital photograph upstairs, so we'll pass by that and you can point that out. Um, and this work is called Rauschenberg First Warhol. So he's combined elements of major names in 20th century art. Um, into this really absurd scene. And it's been fun when we've had student groups, I had a high school group once come who were studying art in the 60s and 70s. So they were familiar with the names of these artists from that class at their um, Springfield Arts Academy. And so we showed them this work and we're inviting them to point out what aspects do you think represent the different artists. Um, you might also remember Jim Roosevelt's work from the Marie Antoinette series that were recently on view too. So we have several of his artworks that have been on view um, in recent memory. Question, did he initially uh, box it, or did you do that? That's his box. That's his yes. box. So he created it and put it in the vitrine, um, and he also took photographs of it. So there was a gallery show where he was selling the photographs of this bird figure um, that were, I think, 10 by 10 or so, sort of replicating the size, the intimacy of the box. Um, and then the actual art object was a gift from a collect to us from collectors who had purchased it from, from the artist. So we can make our way upstairs to the Schnitzer Gallery, and we'll start at the front end of the gallery um, by the intro panel with June's presentation. She uses a lot of map imagery, um, 
I'm just using the, the human body as a site of exploration and just, as the title suggests, trying to uh, reinvent. So if you haven't heard of Tatiana Percero, another artist who's um, working in this vein, you may have heard of Sharon Michotte. Um, she's a Persian photographer, and I'm gonna have my lovely assistants come on over this way. Um, in lieu of a car, I have some pages from a book. Um, but so these are some other pieces of Tatiana Percero that you can see here. And some of these um, have more recognizable sort of Aztec hypnographic imagery. Um, Sorry, we're not getting this on the video, but they're just very, very rich pieces that you can <laughs> see on the codices um, from pre-Columbian Spanish art. Um, and then, uh, excuse me, Sharon Nashat, who's a Persian artist, is kind of doing the same thing. So um, it's really interesting just to see just different cultural interpretations of this kind of idea of layering and using text and image over the body and how, how, we, how we can reinterpret the body um, using these kind of their formations. <laughs> okay, so we're going to actually just move right behind you there to talk about this piece by Che Guevara, or piece of Che Guevara. Um, this is a piece by a, a contemporary Cuban American artist named Lenny Campello. Um, this, this piece is really wonderful and it again represents our commitment to um, showing new media art. If you um, if you just take a look at this piece, you know, first of all, you see the drawing. It's charcoal and Conti crayon, really lovely. Um, but then here in the Sagrada Corazón, you can see there's actually a video embedded into the drawing. Um, so the work is called Santos Guevara's Castum Canis, uh, which can be translated in multiple ways, but it's either Holy or Saint Guevara. Um, and then it can be translated the Castrum Canis part as um, dog of Castro or um, prison dog, a fortress dog. Um, so one of the, the things that has sort of emerged in the cult of Che after his death in 1967 um, is that he's, he's been um, very revered by a lot of people. I'm sure you've all seen his images on t-shirts. He's uh, hugely embedded in popular culture. Um, and really, you know, all of the things that he did in sort of that revolutionary spirit have been remembered. Um, but, it, you know, his um, more controversial aspects um, have not been remembered quite so much. So I enjoyed this piece uh, because the artist sort of problematizes Lenny's, excuse me, Che's, um, sort of the presence of his icon in history. So we see the image of Che sort of very much conflated with a Christological image, but then also underneath here um, in the video, you see a, a news, a, a piece of news footage of Che, and then you also see footage of a firing squad and someone being executed. So uh, just some warning if you're not interested in seeing that, definitely don't, don't come up and look at it. But um, it's, it's just, I think, a very interesting look a chain and it, it sort of problematizes that very popular image of we, that we have of him as you know this peace-loving revolutionary hero. Um, another thing I want to just point out very quickly is um, the frame, which is very ornate. It's got all these beautiful carved pomegranates on it, uh, which is sort of another biblical association. So there's a lot of details in this piece um, that that really bring it to life. Um, one other thing I'll mention about the artist, um, he's from Washington, D.C., and um, a couple years ago, his mustache was voted the in the top ten mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., so you can Google that and take a look, and he'll also be here um, in just a few months, I think, October? October 15th, for um, another gallery talk, which will be absolutely wonderful. Um, we're opening next week a show called For That and Revolutionary Image. Um, and the image, the photographic image that Lenny was sort of basing this image off of um, is a very famous one that appears on all the t-shirts and whatnot that was taken um, by an art, a Cuban artist named Alberto Corda. And we have a series of works of his that um, we've just received on loan from a collector in Maryland. So we're very happy to have those on view. So I hope you'll come back and take a look at those next week. So, okay. Um, just in passing, I want to mention these three works by David Mawad. 
Um, you might have seen them last year when they were on view at the Yogi Center. Um, we had a, a professor, uh, Pedro Garcia Caro, in the Department of Romance Languages, that organized this exhibition in conjunction with a number of classes that he was teaching on mining culture in the Americas and the impact that that has had on the social, political, and environmental landscape down there. Um, so I won't talk too much about these pieces, um, except to point out that the artist graciously um, gave us the entire collection. We were able to purchase six of them, and then he very nicely gave us the rest of them uh, for a total of 41 works. Um, so we have a very nice collection of um, the sort of political pieces that he has done. Um, the show is broken up into sort of three subcategories, looking at the people, the machines, and the landscape involved in the mining community. So, those are those works. And then I just want to point out a couple of more works in this corner before we move to the other side of the gallery. Um, so this lovely print is by a contemporary Mexican artist named Artemio Rodriguez. Um, and the director of the museum and I recently had the opportunity to go to Mexico, uh, which was really wonderful. And we were in a gallery in San Miguel de Allende, and we saw this piece, um, which we were very, very excited about. Um, first of all, Artino Rodriguez is a wonderful uh, contemporary print artist. He's doing a lot of really beautiful things, and he's started to become uh, much more internationally known and is included in a lot of US collections at this point. Um, but when we saw this work, we were particularly excited about it. It's called Dia de Muertos en Edo, or Day of the Dead in Edo, uh, Japan. And so, um, obviously, Day of the Dead is a Mexican celebration and not celebrated in Japan. Um, but this work is really exciting, uh, particularly in terms of our collection, because um, Gertrude Bass Warner, when she founded the museum, uh, was obviously heavily engaged in collecting art from from Asia, um, Japan, China, and Korea in particular. Um, so we have a wonderful collection, a very rich collection of Asian art, um, and we are trying to build our Latin American collection right now, so we felt that this work would have a, a perfect home at the JSMA. So um, if you come and look at this piece, there's a lot of really beautiful details in here. This is a street scene in Edo. Um, you see Mount Fuji in the background. All of these beautiful posters and flags and things, and then um, these really intriguing skeletal figures in kimono. So, that's a wonderful piece. Um, and then these two little photographic works in the corner are um, two of my favorites. This, this project um, is a really, really wonderful project that's happening in Mexico right now. Um, it's called the, well, these two artists um, are different artists, but they're part of a collective called the Chiapas Photography Project. And about two years ago, the Center for Latino, Latina, and Latin American Studies on the University of Oregon campus uh, invited Sister Carlota Duarte to uh, come to the University of Oregon, give a lecture, and she also brought two of the artists that she works with, and they gave a small exhibition. Um, and Dan I invited Danielle and Larry Fong to come see the exhibition, and they liked the work so much that they were able to acquire uh, one of these portfolios for the museum, which was wonderfully exciting. Um, so the Chiapas Photography Project was founded by Carlota in 1992. She's a Mexican-American artist. She uh, was trained at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and then she joined an international community of nuns and went down to Mexico. Um, she's been working down there for several decades. And so in 1992, she founded the Chiapas Photography Project. Um, Chiapas is the southernmost state in Mexico, and um, that state and the state of Oaxaca have sort of the most wonderful array of indigenous languages in Mexico. Um, they're also two of the poorest states in Mexico, and the indigenous populations there have had to deal with a lot of strife, a lot of poverty, um, and this, this project was a way for the indigenous communities there to really engage with their culture um, in a post-colonial way. Of, you know, they, they were given the opportunity to celebrate their culture rather than it being sort of swept under the rug. Um, in addition to these artists learning to express themselves photographically, 
Um, this is also a literacy project, so many of them um, were not able to read or write in any language, um, but throughout the project they learned um, how to read and write in their indigenous language and in Spanish and in some cases English as well. Um, so this year is the project's 21st year, um, and they have been able to serve over 300 indigenous artists from different ethnic and religious backgrounds. So uh, it's a really, really wonderful project, um, just in terms of the, the support that it's giving to these communities. But then also they're producing these just absolutely lovely pieces of art. Um, there's an artist in this collection who has become uh, quite famous internationally now. Her, her works are included in the collections of some of Europe's finest museums. Um, I know she's got a collection of the Reina Sofia in Madrid and various places. This portfolio, uh, only 100 copies were produced. Um, they're in the Library of Congress, the Stanford Library, Princeton, Harvard, um, places like that. So we're very happy to have this collection. Um, and it also came in this beautiful textile um, sort of enclosure that was made by local artisans as well. So we're very happy to be able to support those artists with this portfolio. Um, now I'm just going to scoot on over to this corner um, and talk about another Mexican artist uh, whose name is Rolando Rojas. I just mentioned the state of Oaxaca, and uh, Rolando Rojas is from Oaxaca himself. Um, so we had the pleasure of having an exhibition of his in November uh, that was called Insomnolent Brush Drugs. Um, and just really beautiful, whimsical pieces. Um, the artist said that he named the pieces, uh, or he named the exhibition that because he spent a lot of sleepless nights just sort of pouring over these canvases. Um, he's a very invested artist, very invested in uh, the message that he's trying to relay. And that is, um, again, as, as I was mentioning the Chiapas Photography Project, they're very engaged in their, their local culture. Uh, that's something that's very important to Rolando Rojas as well. So, um, in the majority of his work, you'll see these sort of fantastical creatures, very whimsical. Um, he's very engaged in sort of the mythology of Oaxaca. Um, so you, you see these mythical creatures um, in most of his works. Uh, and this one in particular, he's got um, these figures with these sort of trumpet-like snouts. Um, music is very important to him as well, so that's something that he uh, references a lot in his canvases. Um, and then this is an oil painting, but if you come up close to it, you can see that the texture is uh, extremely varied. And he's got these um, very thick, very gritty patches, and that's because he actually takes sand um, from Oaxaca and mixes it into his paints. So again, just that very sort of visceral connection to um, his community and you know, his pueblo. Um, so anyway, this is a piece that he made specifically for the museum after he had his exhibition here in November. Uh, he gifted this piece to us and uh, the director and I were able to go see it as he was working on it in his studio uh, in Mexico just a couple months ago. Um, so we're very, very happy to have this piece. Um, so those were the, the pieces that I wanted in particular to focus on this evening, uh, mostly because these are pieces that have not been on view yet, but I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Um, this piece seems to have uh, channeled the uh, milk uh, screamer. Mm -hmm. um, the first glance I had at that is I've seen that somewhere before. So I don't know if that's a, a kind of direct um, influence or not, but uh, it certainly struck me. <laughs> and yes, the figure does bear a, a quite a bit of resemblance to um, Ed Barkman's The Scream. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that was a, a conscious um, act on his part. I'll have to ask him. I haven't <laughs> quite thought about that before. A lot of these figures do have that sort of open mouth, um, oh, okay. mask-like quality. Um, I think it probably references um, sort of pre-Columbian masks more than anything, but I, I will be sent an email about that. That's a good question. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? 
This is off topic sure. because you did talk about the fire pieces mm -hmm. except for the one downstairs. Um, do you have all the? Uh, do you have a lot of fiber art in your collection? And if you do, do you have any archives? Can you pull them up on, uh, on some sort of site or what? We do have quite a few textile pieces. Do you know if you happen to know off the top of your head what that count might be? Well, for Pacific Northwest, maybe it's even American. I looked up it, into it when I was looking in the Judas Box and Box acquisition. We don't have as, as many. We actually have, um, I think, maybe only 10 to 20, perhaps, that are North uh, Pacific Northwest. But we have such a strong collection of Asian textiles, um, Korean, Japanese, and Chinese textiles. And so we have been trying to look for textiles from the Americas that will help us not only expand that collection, but also enhance the kind of study we can do of the Asian textiles, the comparisons we can do between textiles of different cultures. So uh, we do have an online catalog with images that are always being added to. We have a couple thousand right now for 13,000 objects in our collection that are available online, but soon at some point they'll all be online. How do you reference it? What link will that You can search by media. So if you go on our website and search the collections, you can search by textile or weaving. It's kind of those key words, and if it appears in the media for the object in our records, it'll bring up the image if there is one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? June and I will both be around for a little bit longer, so we're happy to talk one-on-one, -on -one too, for any other questions that come up. You also mentioned the Helen Ryan. Yes, this Friday night, um, sorry, at 6, I think, we have the Museum After Hours event. So there will be music. June will be providing a tour at intermission. Um, there's food and wine available for purchase from Sweet Cheeks Winery. And so this is something we do every so often to provide great concert and great location. So it's very exciting to have that be available this Friday night. So it'll be a good Who's doing the music? Hallie Loren. Is that pronounced Hallie Loren? I think she may have played here before. I think she's like a She's a vocalist. And then she was a band. And she sells us out. She plays here. Oh, she sells us out. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us today.